please feel free to follow along in the back of the bulletin as I read Isaiah 60, 1 through 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around, and they all gather to you, together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters, daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you, and the wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall, come to, shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord.
from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts gold, frankincense, and myrrh. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we celebrate a, another trip around the sun and this new year, we resolve to ourselves that this year will be better than the last. Perhaps you've already resolved to exercise more, eat less, love more, worry less. We'll let go of the past, embrace the new that is to come. Doesn't this sound familiar? You know, it's really almost a universal longing, at least it seems to be. The Chinese New Year, every year the date changes, but falls somewhere between January 21st February 21st. It's dependent on the new moon of the first lunar month. This year it'll be in uh, February on the 5th. The 15-day observation observance is most important of the traditional Chinese holidays. It's their spring festival. The Ethiopians have a new year called Inkakatash, in meaning the gift of of jewels, and it'll be September 12th at the end of their big rains, filled with a time of dancing and singing and celebrations as the people celebrate their spring festival. Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year, celebrated in autumn on the first two days of the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. For Hebrews, it's a time of introspection, a time to look back at their mistakes over the past year. And the plan changes for this new year. The holiday is marked with the eating of apples dipped in honey as a symbol of the sweetness of a new year. Most of the day is spent in the synagogue as it is the most holiest of days. So for some cultures, new year is celebrated as new life springs forth from the ground. Others, like ours, in the midst of cold midwinter, everything is dead and dormant. Some are related to harvest and autumn as flowers and fruit fall from, are gathered or left to wither unused. Yet each of these share a similar motif, recognizing the amazing gift that a new year is, a chance to move forward to put behind the old, embrace the new year. And so this, my friends, is what new beginnings are for us. 
a time of celebrating and honoring as we begin the new year. Our faith, it is called to be renewed. Not only annually as we set the calendar forward, but each and every day. Our faith is one of introspection, of reflection, and carefully, intentionally nurturing our faith. It is a gift. I hope you recognize it. The newness of renewal. In fact, I invite you to join us Wednesday for our wonderful Wednesday as I'll discover together some opportunities for renewal, devotion in the new year. And next Sunday, please join us as we celebrate a renewal of our baptismal vows. But for today, we celebrate the day of Epiphany, the occasion of God's revelation to the outside world, the visit of these magi or wise men to the infant Messiah. Matthew's gospel skips the shepherds, the angels, and instead, after providing a detailed genealogy of Christ, leads his gospel off with this encounter from these astrologers from the east. Their story is quite familiar. Their song, sung for ages. Their gifts, even legendary. Through the ages, in fact, interpreters have devised all kinds of allegorical schemes about these three gifts. The ones that I shared with the children are one example of that. And perhaps God does work like that. But no less important, they simply may have brought what was precious to them and what they wanted Jesus to have. Quite likely, Mary and Joseph had registered at the local Bethlehem Babies R Us for the usual swaddling clothes, stuffed lambs, cans with formula enriched with DHA, of course. But when the wise men arrive, offer their gifts, they're not on the registry, nor are they anything that Mary or Joseph could have ever imagined. I have a lot of questions for these so-called wise men. Maybe you do too. We venerate the Magi, exalting their actions, invite modern disciples to emulate them, yet I wonder if they're really worthy of our admiration. What were they looking for? They say, where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Had they come from just across the desert on a newborn king's star tour, maybe? Did they just finish at the pyramids asking, where is he who is born the new pharaoh of Egypt? We have seen his star. We have three more to check off before we can head home. And what was it about this star that they knew it signaled the birth of the king of the Jews What sacred texts were special to them? What did they access? And what else might have the stars told them? And why was the king of the Jews of any significance to them? They, sometimes called kings themselves, were they looking for a greater king to serve? They traveled far, we know that, following a star. But as the star led them close to the capital of Jerusalem, did they assume that they had arrived and knocked on the palace door? Had they lost sight of the star or had the light pollution of the great city obscure its guidance? They put the whole story in danger, knocking on that palace door and Soon they find their mistake. And once they're informed by the scribes of this ancient prophecy, they venture outside the palace walls, and voila, there's the star again. Leads them a bit out of town to a quiet and dark village of Nowheresville, Bethlehem. And there, did the Magi find what they were looking for? 
They bring their gifts and worship, and this is what puzzles me next. They leave. Why not stick around? Did not whatever told them that this was something special, something worth coming all this way for, not indicate it was something worth sticking around for, watching how the rest of the story plays out? Why not stick around, devote their whole lives to ones of discipleship? This is a message of blessing, though, a message of gifts. We're familiar with the gold, the frankincense even, and the myrrh. Amazing gifts, certainly, but I'd like us to look at what the kings bring instead to look at the gifts that the kings received. Let's look at the star. For the star is truly a remarkable gift. For the star leads these magi to the Messiah. The star illumines the way to God's self-revealing. The star is a gift, a gift from God. Without the star, the magi would never have encountered the Christ child. They lose sight of the star, perhaps, from their own preconceived notions. But once they find it again, they are exceedingly joy-filled. They realize their error, putting not their trust in their own ideas or the attraction of earthly power, and cast their eyes again on the God-given gift, the star. And so while these wise men from the east only visit briefly, leave the child to start off on their own. Fortunately, the star has brought us too brought us to the manger, brought us to the Christ child. The star is our gift. They might leave, but we're invited to linger, to stay, and ourselves worship. And this is what all spiritual gifts offer. The star brings us closer to the presence of God. All good gifts from God do this. You see, If we truly understand what blessings are, blessings are not for our material benefit, but blessings are to help us draw closer to God, the gift giver. So think for a moment of your blessings. How can they each draw you closer, make you stronger in your relationship with God? Make sure you haven't labeled something a blessing if it's drawing you away from God spiritually. And today I'd like to introduce you to a epiphany tradition called star gifts. You'll see them briefly described at the bottom of your bulletin. And I invite you to read that as time allows. Each of you will have the opportunity to come forward as we partake in communion together and receive a word, a gift, a blessing. They're printed on simple pieces of paper in a basket. I've seen this done uh, for many years now, and the anticipation of receiving a star gift can be quite amazing, especially for someone who's familiar and has seen how a star gift can bring a blessing to one's life. I've seen young and old come forward approach the pile of multicolored paper and and not want the first one of course but this one buried way underneath that's the one they want and you're welcome to do that as time allows of course each of uh, these pieces of paper have a simple word and i encourage you to use this word as a blessing to receive it as a gift from God, something that might challenge you for the year, maybe something you need more of. Maybe it's something you need to be validated for. Say, this is something that is special to you or for you, so live into it. It may be something challenging, like I said, something difficult. It may be 
something that you'll grow into throughout the year. But I encourage you to take this star gift, pray about it, receive it as a gift from God, place it in a very conspicuous place, maybe on your bathroom mirror or in your car, tagged on the dashboard, and use it as an opportunity to be reminded that God is with you each and every day, wherever you go, and wants to bless you and grow you and renew you. The star that brought the wise men to Jesus, like them, how might this simple gift simple word provide a year's worth of opportunities for worship and service and devotion how might this provide opportunity for you to serve and bless others we have been gathered around tables all season with friends, with family, with folks we rarely get to see perhaps except for these special times. And this table is not unlike those family tables in your homes and in your loved ones' homes. It is a place for us to gather, to celebrate, to be reconnected, to celebrate what makes us family. This is the Lord's table, and it is a gift to us. It is also a place where we show our gratitude, our thanksgiving. For Christ offered us this meal as a foretaste of what we will have in eternity, in heaven, at great price, the sacrifice of his own life for us and for this world. Here at this table, we are met and fed. Here at this table, we are blessed and give our thanks. This morning, we will come at Christ's invitation to receive from him his great gift of love and grace, and we celebrate with all who put their trust and faith in him. You'll come forward as we celebrate communion by intinction, partaking uh, the bread and the cup. And then again, you'll be invited to take from the basket a, a gift, a gift from God to you for this year, a gift of renewal, a gift of blessing, a gift of love and grace. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, for your love for us and Jesus Christ knew no boundaries. It came to heaven, born the simple, poor couple who you entrusted your greatest, li- your greatest gift. Wise men from afar came and realized, recognized something special, offered their very best, And because of their worship, because of their story, we have a glimpse into our story as well. So, God, as we come around this table at your beckoning, at your blessing, meet us here. Pour out your spirit upon this bread and this cup. Make it for us a blessing. And make us for this world a blessing, O God. We offer all this with the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I do want to acknowledge, since we do partake of communion by intinction, and this is the
cold and flu season, there are bottles of hand sanitizer at the center aisle on most of the pews. So uh, you're welcome to partake of the hand sanitizer before you partake of communion. Well, as the 